Greetings, and welcome to the latest episode of ASME's six-part series of conversations where we examine the impact of technology and engineering on a post-COVID-19 new normal. I'm Jeffrey Winters, Senior Editor at Mechanical Engineering Magazine. Today's topic is one that most of us have been wondering about. How well are our workplaces protected from coronavirus infection? Um, and what steps are, can we take to improve this level of protection? Starting in March, many businesses in the United States and around the world were closed to try to break the chain of coronavirus infection. Now, as many places have begun to reopen, employers, uh, employees who have returned to work have looked at their workplaces in a new light. I know that I will never look at an open plan office space ever uh, the same way ever again. Today and for the rest of the month, ASME will be providing in-depth conversations on corona, uh, and coronavirus and COVID related uh, topics, including improving supply chains, deploying more robust robotic workforces, and how to manufacture smarter and safer. For today's conversation, uh, we, are, we are pleased to present three experts um, who, who know about indoor air quality and modeling airflow through, through spaces like workspaces. Um, let's, let's start off with Shelley Miller, who's an expert on indoor air quality, the health effects of urban air pollution, and development and valuation of air quality control measures. She's a professor of mechanical engineering at the University of Colorado in Boulder and a faculty member of the university's environmental engineering program. Dr. Miller's research projects include engineering controls for reducing exposures to infectious diseases, as well as viral aerosol characterization and control. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Miller. Um, William Bonfleth is a professor of architectural engineering at Penn State. Dr. Bonfleth has also worked at the US Army Construction Engineering Research Laboratory in Champaign, Illinois, and at ZBA, a Cincinnati-based consulting engineering firm. Dr. Bonfleth is an expert in HVAC systems. His research focus on indoor air quality control with a specialty in germicidal ultraviolet systems. And he's served as president of ASHRAE from 2013 to 2014 and currently chairs its epidemic task force. Dr. Bonfleth, uh, <laughs> Dr. Bonfleth thank you for joining us today. Glad to be with you. And Adrian Mann is director at Simulia Worldwide Industry Solutions, where he leads the development, deployment, and enablement of all simulation solutions for digital design within the industrial equipment segment. Mr. Mann also leads the Create Safe Life Environment Through Simulation Initiative, for which the goal is to bring a set of simulation and modeling solutions for the control and mitigation of uh, propagation, uh, 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 the mitigation of the propagation of contaminants such as COVID-19 aerosols in various ventilated environments like hospitals, aircraft, offices, factories, and trains. Interesting work. Thank you for joining us, uh, uh, Mr. Mann. Thank you. Before we begin, I want to thank our supporters, Dassault Systems, a multinational software company that specializes in 3D design and product lifestyle cycle management software and Safety Services Company, North America's leading provider of safety, training, and compliance solutions. So with all that, let's get started. Many people today are still working from home, but ordinarily we spend most of our daytime hours at work. This pandemic has shown that some workplaces have an increased risk of infection. Um, Dr. Miller, you're an expert on in, uh, how indoor air quality affects health. How large of a role do workplaces such as offices and schools play in spreading viruses? This is a great question. And unfortunately we don't yet know the total answer to this question, but at looking at recent outbreaks and the characteristics that are becoming very clearly defined as the common characteristic for each outbreak, I think we can define a few key features of workplaces and schools that we need to pay attention to. You know, most workplaces have been designed 
to be comfortable and ventilation is provided for comfort. It isn't typically always looked at as provided for health. Uh, what we do see is that workplaces and locations in which the, it could be um, crowded, it could be um, lots of people in the same space, and it could be minimal ventilation with uh, fresh outside air as being at higher risk, especially when people are spending more time because the risk goes up as you spend more time in an environment where you have higher concentrations and fresh outside air provided typically through ventilation systems or even open windows can dilute the concentrations and bring the risk down. So I think with each uh, building and each particular scenario, people need to look at whether the risk will be higher if they have less fresh air and more people and they will be there longer. Okay. Um, Dr. Bonfleth, could you provide some more background on this? And could you let us know, are there any famous cases of disease outbreaks occurring in workplaces? And are any of them specific to COVID-19? Uh, there certainly have been some uh, examples of uh, disease transmission through the air and in closed environments, the, starting with the ones that are most uh, notable for COVID-19, the Korean call center has been much discussed. That was, uh, as Dr. Miller was saying, a case where you had a high density occupancy in a space and over the course of a week there were infections through, throughout that space and um, they don't seem to necessarily be associated with uh, short range transmission, which is what WHO and CDC say is the, the main uh, mode of transmission. Another one, uh, I would call a restaurant a workplace, at least for people who, sure, yeah. who are uh, involved in the restaurant industry and the, the, the Guangzhou China restaurant case is another interesting one. And, and again, there was relatively high density there, but I think that's a case that uh, uh, is one of, of perhaps low ventilation rate being the problem. When you put those two things together, low ventilation rate and, and high density, then you have a prescription for a, a super spreading event. Yeah, and in both of those cases that you mentioned, it seemed like there was a very sharp, you know, sort of physical uh, differentiation between where people got infected and where people didn't. Yeah, I, I think the uh, in the restaurant in, in particular, you have uh, three tables that were within the, the zone that was being recirculated by one piece of air conditioning equipment by one fan coil unit. And, and so the, the transmission was short distance, but not really so short that it fit the model of droplet right. transmission. There was uh, an increase in concentration there because the space was so poorly ventilated, but the rest of the restaurant didn't generate a single case. Okay. Um, Mr. Mann, you've, you've worked on models of airflow through public spaces. Are, are there any aspects of workplaces that you've seen that could contribute to the spread of coronavirus? So, you know, when we started working on this topic, um, we started using, I mean, actually we didn't know, you know, exactly how the, the virus would be propagating because we were modeling the, the, the cough or sneeze and seeing how the, the particles would be propagating depending on the viral loads too. And what we saw is that, uh, I mean, basically I'm just confirming everything that has been said so far, is that the, 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 the airflow provided by the, the ventilation systems and the HVAC systems uh, they tend to carry or carry you know the the particles further than what they would be naturally uh, if you if you follow you know the recommendation from CDC or the organization like where the, the six the six six feet uh, regulation and because they're being transported away um, it, it's sometimes I mean what we've seen in simulation that sometimes um, they're going to be carried towards the, the HVAC outlets and then of course going to go through the filtering system if there is one. Um, they're going to be cleaning the air, but some of the times it's actually you start seeing some uh, recirculation areas where um, those like small particles tend to actually stay and they can actually accumulate in concentration if you don't break this cycle of, of recirculation from the ventilation system. So it depends really on the design. I mean, if it's a really good design for, for really recirculating the entire area or not. Yeah. Okay. And we've seen you know, in the United States, especially outbreaks in meatpacking plants um, in other countries' offices and restaurants, as Dr. Bonfleth mentioned, and other workplaces. Let me toss this out to whoever wants to start off. Are there challenges specific to 
to offices, you know, like where, where a lot of um, engineers were that are, that we need to specifically focus on. I'll, 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 I'll go on that one. <laughs> offices, uh, it, it's all proximity. Now, the first thing you have to do is separate people and, and uh, minimize the amount of short range contact. And I, I think for a, an office, it's typically well ventilated and has good filtration. That's the, the main risk factor uh, for, for other occupancies or other uh, applications like meatpacking plants. It's entirely different. People are standing to shoulder to, sh to shoulder for hours on end with air blowing along the, the line, moving particles, as Adrian was saying, from one to another. Um, I mean, one thing that I, I think has really been a, you know, a big issue and a concern is, is schools, especially um, colleges and universities, um, thinking about opening up in the fall. Um, are there, are there you know, specific concerns about those environments uh, and the spread of, of um, the coronavirus? I think I can add a few things to what Dr. Baumfuss said, which is, you know, clearly proximity is a huge issue. And I think work environments and schools in particular need to consider uh, who is coming into their buildings and whether that building is at a higher risk for transmission due to its design or its age or uh, what it's being used for. And as we discuss how to open campuses and schools, I think an interesting way to go is to assess each building for its potential risk and how um, what kinds of strategies you need to implement in these buildings because most almost all transmissions happen in buildings mm. so we also need to figure out who's coming into our building and why and i know that when we open our labs and our classrooms i want to know you know every day what symptoms do you have what temperature do you have and have you been near anyone who has had the disease now that will get a lot of information to you. It won't get everything to you because of the asymptomatic transmission. But I think thinking of these strategies as a bundled approach where many of our environments aren't prepared to control infectious disease transmissions yet. So we also need to add on uh, figuring out who's coming into our building. How do we control them so that they don't congregate into small areas for a long time and be in proximity to people who may have the disease uh, and putting this all together in a strategy that will reduce your overall risk. So just to, to follow up on that, it sounds like from what you're saying, the, the best place to start in securing a, a building environment from the spread of coronavirus is actually at the front door. Mm -hmm. My yeah. opinion. <laughs> okay, uh, fair enough. Um, well, the, you know, there, there are pinch points in, in buildings. Think of a tall office building in, mm -hmm. in Manhattan. Uh, how do you get that building filled up using the elevators that it was, it has with their designed occupancy, now that you can only put, say, four people in a car. Sure. Sure. And, and you can think of lots of other examples, getting students into and out of classes on a class change. Oh, yeah. yeah. Maybe, maybe to, to add up on this topic is that uh, the, the, large, the large difference we have between a factory and an office or a school is in the factory, it's going to be a large volume and it's going to be more about the airflow. I mean, how, how it's propagating this large volume. but. We had the chance to simulate some environments uh, like hospitals or even our own offices. And so what we saw is that because the airflow is guided through the, you know, through the, the hallways uh, and basically it's, it's very easy for, the, for the, the, the contaminant to transport through the, through the, the floors and basically being in, an, in a certain environment like the hallways and the, you know, the, the entry of the office uh, where you're gonna have all the people going through. And so you end up having everybody going through this contaminant, contaminated area um, and, and basically being, uh, being exposed. But of course, then from that, you can, you know, I mean, at least through simulation, what we've seen is that we can start looking at um, ways of correcting this. And we've mentioned it at the beginning, like even just sometimes opening windows can create this pressure difference that's going to be pushing the, the contaminant another way than through the hallway and basically right. ensuring that at least some of the common areas are not going to be contaminated by, by people. Oh, I just wanted to follow up on something that you mentioned that was really interesting. So you, you actually modeled your own workspace? We did, yes. Uh, did, did, in, did that reassure did you or did it make you more worried? 
Um, let's say that we feel like we were more in control of what was going on. Uh, but the, yeah, when we first, you know, when we did the first simulation, you know, we, we did see things that were like, well, we need to pay attention to this. Sometimes we're missing some information. You know, we, we have, a, a, say, a concentration uh, coming on, but then, you know, the, mm -hmm. that's concentration of, let's say, of, um, of water. I mean, what you're expelling when you're inhaling, or if, I'm sorry, when you're breathing or coughing or sneezing. But then there is a viral load to take into account too, and that's that's making okay. a little bit of difference. So there's, I think, quantitative points that we have to be careful in terms of assumptions. But yes, you can minimize the risk uh, by by doing those tricks, I say, or these changes to the ventilation system. Okay, yeah. very good, Dr. Bonfleth. You are the past president of ASHRAE. Are there some adaptations to HVAC systems that we could use to cut the spread of viruses? And I'm thinking specifically of things like filters or air cleaners or something like that, that, that within the, the system. Yeah, certainly. That's what we're looking at in, in developing <laughs> guidance in, in ASHRAE uh, now is how to reduce the concentration of infectious material in the air. So one thing you can do is you can actually adjust the ventilation controls, you know, not, not equipment, just adjust the operation of the system to bring in more outside air, which is possible for lots of systems. The second thing is to upgrade filtration. The, the level of particle filtration in most systems that are just barely meeting code uh, don't do a very good job of removing small particles of the size that are produced by respiratory aerosols. So we're recommending a sub significant upgrade in filter efficiency, but not to the HEPA level because most buildings can't do that. And the other thing that can be helpful is, is certain types of air disinfection uh, equipment. Mm -hmm. This uh, germicidal ultraviolet technology that, that uh, I've studied for many years and, and Dr. Miller as well has been demonstrated to be quite effective. The CDC approved it for uh, use in tuberculosis control decades ago. So that's a, an available and, and fairly cost-effective uh, technology for further reducing uh, risk. Okay, very good. Um, and Mr. Mann, in terms of reducing you know, or slowing airflow through, through offices, um, what do you, what's the effect of partitions in large open office environments or, or cubicles or even like old fashioned offices? Well, I mean, it depends. Again, that's going to be depending on two things, right? It's going to depend on the layout of your desks and going to be the layout of your closed cubicles or, I mean, open space obviously is going to be, you know, making it easier for the airflow to transport across the office. But it's going to be really depend on, depending on your HVAC system layout, right? I mean, where are going to be your, your vents? Where are going to be your inlets, outlets? And that's going to be basically creating the, the recirculation. You might have a certain um, organization of the office that's going to be matching the HVAC layout and, you know, minimizing the risk of, contamin of building up of contaminants. And you might have another layout that's going to actually going to be increasing it. So when we do our simulations, we actually also account for the furniture to make sure that we, we are able to see these kind of patterns. Okay. And Dr. Miller, uh, you know, a lot has been made, you know, by shops and offices about frequent cleaning of the so-called high touch surfaces. You know, I, I suppose it doesn't hurt, but in terms of reducing the re disease spread, especially of coronavirus, how much will that help? So we don't actually know the main mode of transmission for coronavirus, but we do know that there is um, a, a strong indication that inhalation of airborne respiratory droplets is, is causing a lot of the transmission. I th the CDC recently downplayed uh, fomite contact transmission, and uh, but we, we still don't Personally, I have not seen the data to support like which one is the main mode, but I, it's very clear airborne is happening. Um, I think cleaning the high touch surfaces is really important. I think looking at the possibility of resuspension of particles that have deposited on your surfaces is of concern. There's, um, there's a lot of indication that it ends up on surfaces and floors and is it being resuspended is, is I think something we really need to look at. Um, and I do think, I'm really glad Dr. Bonfa mentioned UV as a as an add-on technology. You know, our buildings aren't ready to control, uh, many of them are not ready to control infectious disease transmission, but we have add-on technologies that are really useful. We don't have, we know how to put your germicidal UV in, in healthcare facilities. Based on that knowledge, we can provide recommendations to workspaces to utilize that technology, as well as high efficiency air cleaners or fan filter units. I think 
placing these in strategic locations could help increase your air changes per hour for reducing um, airborne particles in your space. Okay, I just, just to shift gears a bit, um, you know, the, this webinar is being hosted by ASME. I was wondering, do, do any of you guys have a, a sense of the role that that engineering groups like ASHRAE or ASME could play in, in um, you know, working on, on creating a safer environment in, in workspaces. I mean, I, you mentioned CDC, Dr. Bonfleth and, and, and Dr. Miller. I'm just wondering, um, you know, non-governmental non agencies, do they have a role? Oh, well, certainly they do. ASHRAE is the organization that develops the, the main ventilation standards that are used throughout the uh, US and, and actually globally to some extent. So uh, the healthcare ventilation standard 170, uh, 62.1 for, for non-residential buildings and 62.2, those standards are all likely to change in terms of uh, perhaps requiring higher filter efficiencies in the future. And I think another thing we may see in standards is consideration not only of normal operation, but also of uh, uh, emergency operation, mm. the, the, sort of the, the movement of uh, concepts of resilience into our basic design standards. Okay, very good. Um, so from the beginning of this pandemic, it seems, we've been seeing, or at least I've been seeing a lot of think pieces about the end of the open office plan as a fallout of COVID-19. Um, but are there some work environments that are going to be really, really hard to virus proof? Um, you know, above and beyond, like just sort of putting in partitions or, or, or filters or something like that. Um, Dr. Mann, or Mr. Mann, do you have, have any thoughts on that? Um, well, I, you know, we can consider them as workplace as well, but I think for hospitals, it's gonna be something that's pretty difficult. Uh, and that's specifically because in this, pan during this pandemic, we've seen that, you know, the emergency care and units have not been able to support the entirety of, you know, the, the patients. And basically, people have been starting to be placed into areas where it's not necessarily made for um, for proper care of, of, of contagious disease. And um, so we actually we had the chance of of supporting a, an hospital in France on this topic, where um, the well they they observed that some of the you know of the healthcare workers. In, in areas where they were not wearing masks because uh, you know it was maybe the area that was not supposed to be uh, contaminated, or even more, you know, the nurse ward, nurse, uh, sorry, the, the the nursing ward, which was basically where the old, in the middle old people were, were taken care of. Um, they started seeing cases of infection, even though nobody was coming in with the disease, hmm. and that was all because the, the the design of the hospital was already from a certain age. Uh, and the ventilation system was such in a way that it was trying to suck as much air as possible from the nursing ward, but bringing in contaminant from the other areas of the hospitals. Um, so, so basically there are a lot of areas and specifically hospitals which have been designed a certain way, but in those times of crisis, um, basically they can operate in a different way that in a, against the way that they should be operating to prevent uh, the, the propagation of disease and putting some of the workers at risk because you know, those are the workers too, so. Sure. Um, Dr. Miller or Dr. Bonfleth, either of you want to jump in? Well, I, I think that any uh, environment in which there's close contact between people uh, is, is a risky place. Dentist's office, uh, the hospital, because you have healthcare workers and, and patients. Uh, I think something like maybe a, a health club, a gymnasium, keeping all of those surfaces clean. And, and one more point I'd like to make though is, we've got to be careful not to, to figure out how to win the last battle. The next epidemic disease that comes around may have entirely different transmission characteristics than COVID-19. Might be something that's primarily and obviously airborne instead of something that seems to be uh, close contact. So that is something that has to be factored into the thinking too. Okay. Dr. Miller? Yeah, I think for infectious disease control, you need to have this suite of strategies that really cover all your bases and, and until you know otherwise, that's why you should keep cleaning the surfaces and your hands and also wearing your masks and staying, oh, staying in, out of close proximity from people that you don't know whether they have the disease. 
Fair enough. Um, is there any danger that in the, I, I think to follow up on Dr. Bonfleth's point, is there any danger that in the effort to stop this virus that we have right now, that we might create some other problems for indoor air quality? Um, you know, or with the moisture, you know, management of moisture or large increases in wasted energy or, or things like that? Well, certainly the, probably the, the one strategy that's been recommended uh, a lot that could cause problems is uh, eliminating recirculation in, in systems. Uh, a lot of the systems that are used in the U.S. may have uh, five units of recirculated air for every unit of outside air that's brought in, and they were designed on a summer day to, to keep the building cool and dry with those proportions. If you change that system to being 100% outside air, you won't be able to meet the, the cooling load, you won't be able to meet the dehumidification load, and the energy use will go up uh, tremendously. So that's been recommended somewhat, I think, as a uh, highly conservative emergency measure when we get all the data in and, and think about what should we do next time. Uh, I think things like that will have to be reconsidered from the point of view of how effective were they really and because of their negative consequences, is that really something that we should be recommending or is there a better way? Okay, very good. And if I could add one more point, which is my concern for indoor air quality is that a lot of people are using you know, pretty toxic chemicals to clean surfaces and spray into buildings and uh, so I think that we need to be very careful with the technologies that we use to decontaminate surfaces and the chemicals we're using to, to not create a bigger problem for the, for the occupants than we need to be. And there's a lot of, the problem in indoor air quality is there's a lot of um, fly-by-night, like big ideas that, that are not applicable for indoor spaces. You know, many new technologies generate ozone, they emit toxic chemicals, they don't work because they don't have a big enough fan to recirculate the air through the cleaning device. And so I think people need to be concerned and aware that, you know, we have tried and true approaches and technologies that they need to pay attention to. Yeah, I want I mean, to add, add one thing to that, which is to the, the point about chemicals. I, I was on an EPA call last week where they were talking about do we need to be concerned about hand sanitizer and disinfectant emissions when people go back into buildings so that's already been raised as an issue yeah i mean actually i want to jump on dr miller's point um again because that's kind of interesting it seems like in a in a crisis like this there's sort of a space for entrepreneurial entrepreneurs to to create you know new products that are new and now we'll be able to solve the problem and yet, you know, they haven't gone through the testing. They haven't been really sort of vetted to see whether they're safe or whether they create like five problems for every one problem that they that they solve. I mean, that that's an excellent point. I mean, um, is there a way to 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 sort of slow down the, the process of, of implementing some of these these um, as you call fly by night um, ideas? Well, there are plenty of guidance out there from. Uh, organizations like ASHRAE and, and EPA on what has been tested, what works, and we should stick to those guidance. We've been studying, you know, the area of air cleaners for decades, and we know what works and how to implement it. I always do turn people to places that do certify technology, like California Air Resources Board has great work. EPA has a great document on, on air cleaners. Um, they, um, AHAM the, um, has certifications and standardized air cleaners. So, you know, CDC has guidance on UV. There's a lot of good information out there, and I think people should rely on that. Very good. Maybe, maybe one additional point on my side. So, um, actually, we have the chance to work with a lot of the players in the HVAC industry. Uh, I mean, you know, the, the pro I say the supplier of the construction um, industry in terms of uh, providing the actual units for HVAC system. And we see a lot of them, you know, back to this entrepreneur uh, spirit, they are really working very hard on developing those cleaning systems and trying to, to build systems that are going to be able to deal with this kind of, of problems. And what we've seen is that they've They've been asking us, you know, what kind of uh, simulation solutions do we have to, to try to assess the efficiency of the of the actual of the of the you know the product that they are building. Um, of course, you still need to bring it to certification and everything at the end. That's that there's a question about that. 
uh, but at least through simulation that's been that's helping them to develop product that's going to be performing the way that they want to uh, down the road so, so you need to be helping for them you need to be able to answer a few questions clearly does this technology work period does this device implementing that technology work and, and is it safe? It's, it's almost the same questions you would ask about a vaccine or, or, or some other drug. Because if, if uh, technology is changing the air that you're breathing, then you need to know that that's not going to harm you while it's disinfecting the air. Take ozone as an example, as a disinfectant. Works great on, on microorganisms, works great on people too. Fair enough, fair enough. Um, finally, I'd like to go around the, the Zoom table and, and ask each of you, if you were going to design the office factory or classroom of the future, what features would it have to deter the spread of diseases like coronavirus or, or as, as the point out, other diseases that, that might be popping up in the, in the near future? Um, um, start with Dr. Miller, please. So I'll just start with a few ideas. I, I think we really need to minimize air currents throughout the space. So we could kick those to the uh, Mr. Mann and Dr. Bonfleth for suggesting how we do that. Uh, I think we need to maintain social distancing. We've also seen research in our community that shows when you're seated, if you see um, uh, in, in line with each other and facing all in the same direction, it can minimize exposure. And I think we need to minimize the time spent in, you know, one set location in a building. The, the inline thing, it's sort of interesting. I mean, that sounds like something that might be used for, for classrooms in, in the fall and going forward. Yeah. Um, um, Mr. Mann, do you, do you have any, you know, what's on your wish list? <laughs> um, well, on my, I think on my wish list, it's a lot of, um, of, of, of the way of treating the airflow, it's just like uh, Dr. Miller was saying, uh, you know, the, the notion of microclimate in the sense of the notion of really uh, making sure that the, 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 you know, the, the, the airflow, I mean, the, the, the pocket of recirculation are basically really uh, as small as possible and they're basically dedicated to a certain area, mean, meaning that um, if there is a contaminated person in that area, basically the, most of the contaminants are going to be, you know, recirculated and actually cleaned if there is a proper cleaning system, cleaning system obviously, uh, and not going to be spreading across the, the office. Um, the other thing, and I, I mean, you know, I don't know if it's going to be like this for the for the rest of time, uh, but I think we're going to have to wear masks because, uh, I mean, at least on our side from social simulation, we've been able to model the, the masks as well, and we clearly see, you know, a decrease in the amount of uh, contaminants, at least of, uh, you know, part, uh, particles and droplets that can be propagating from sneezing or from breathing. Uh, but just by wearing a mask. So, you know, that's, in, I think in Asia, there is a culture about wearing the mask everywhere at the office in the public transportation. Um, that might end up being, uh, you know, becoming something that we might have to adopt as well. Um, not that it's my wish list <laughs> at all, right. but uh, it's, it, you know, at least for, the, for our own safety, that might be something to, to keep doing for a while. Okay, good. Dr. Bonfleth. Well, I'd like to see things done that, first of all, would improve the air quality in buildings all the time. So better filtration and, and better ventilation. But beyond that, uh, there are a lot of architectural uh, solutions that are necessary. Specify uh, low transfer surfaces, design buildings so that you don't have these areas in them where people congregate that have bad air quality. And I'm thinking particularly of of restrooms and, and elevators in buildings. I think you need to rethink the building from the ground up to, to see where the, the real infection risk areas are and, and concentrate on uh, improving those. Okay. And just to follow up with all of you guys, I mean, what is the time frame for these sorts of changes? They seem like they're like very large, very sort of holistic changes to, to our built environment. Are, is this something that can be done in the next like 12, 24 months, or are these going to be sort of long-term changes that we have to, to, to work through? Well, there's a spectrum of, of uh, things that can be done to existing buildings, and it's much more limited than what you can do with a new one. So I, I think you could get some of these ideas into new buildings soon, but the, the turnover in new buildings is pretty small compared to the number that already exists. Dr. Miller? Yeah, I think some of these uh, I think some of them can be implemented quite quickly and rapidly, and some do need um, a lot of 
implementation in existing buildings and planning, you know, but for new buildings, uh, I think it's very clear what we need to, to be doing going forward, but how do we maintain and retrofit existing mm -hmm. buildings has a whole host of timelines associated with it. So I think, you know, that is an important question. Okay, very good. Well, that pretty much does it for today. I'd, I'd like to thank Shelley Miller, William Bonflath, and Adrian Mann for, for joining us today. I'd also like to thank Dassault Systems and Safety Services Company for supporting today's conversation. I encourage all of you listening today to, to join us for the next conversation, which will be on June 9th when Alan S. Brown discusses how companies are taking the lessons from the recent economic shutdowns to create more a, ro a more robust supply chain. And um, please um, watch an interview with ASME Executive Director and CEO uh, Tom Costabile, who shares his perspective on how engineers are joining the fight against COVID-19. A link to that interview will, is, should be located on the resources section of your screen. Um, I'd like to thank you all for tuning in and I hope you join, the rest, uh, join us for our next conversation and you know, have, a, have a safe and, and healthy day. Thank you so much.